Harry Met Virtual Traveller, hello and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that explores folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson and I am an author and professional storyteller. This month, patrons chose the theme of Lights Above the Marshes. And so for this episode, I'll be looking at the marshes, fens and cars of Britain and of course the folklore surrounding the wee beasties that live there. The story from law for this episode is The Tiddyman. There are some dark folkloric characters explored in this podcast and so as always I would recommend that you listen through first before listening with younger members of your household. It could be said that the vast expanse of peaty, soggy land that makes up the marshes and the fens are in danger of being seen as boring, flat, cold and unwelcoming. However, if you look a little closer at this often man-made landscape, it is not only teeming with wildlife and history, but it is also full of folklore and stories. There is a legend that tells of the creation of the fens of Lincolnshire and that they came about through the wrath of the gods who flooded the land in response to the Roman governor Valerian's treatment of the Iceni people. A great wave flooded the land and left a wilderness of islands in the marsh. This land has always been our feral child which refused to be tamed. We've been trying to control the fens for hundreds of years. But what exactly are they? And what is the difference between a fen, a marsh and a car? Fens are mainly found in Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire and Norfolk and they are the product of drained saltwater marshland. The land has frequently been drained in this way since the 17th century and I'll be talking a little more about that later on in this episode when I'll be looking at the folklore of the Tiddyman. But for now, I want to stick with defining the spaces I'm about to talk about. Moving on to the marshes, these are areas of land which are frequently waterlogged, either when there is a lot of rain or they might be tidal if they're near the coast. The main difference between a fen and a marsh is a fen once was a marsh and could easily become one again. Marshlands are in numerous places and in fact a marsh is pretty much anywhere that has waterlogged ground. A car, spelt C-A-R-R, is an area of fenland which has a lot of woodland or low-lying bushes on it. These shrubs and trees are predominantly water-loving such as alder or willow. Car is an Old Norse word which effectively describes an overgrown marsh. So now we know what they are, what is the folklore of these places and the stories that have sprung from them? In Norfolk, it is fair to say that one of the most famous pieces of folklore is that of the Black Dog or Old Shuck, and it's also said to roam the fens. The first episode of season one of this podcast is all about black dogs and so I'm not going to go too much into depth about these spectral creatures. However, I would like to take a moment to look at a very recent addition to fen folklore and that is the fen tiger. This black panther-like apparition was first spotted in Cambridgeshire in 1978. Someone reported seeing a tiger-like creature stalking the fens. Through the decades there have been further sightings in the 80s and then an actual photo was taken in the 90s but the identity of the beast was still not considered certain. And then in 2010 someone claimed again to have seen the Fen Tiger. The evidence of this was some large footprints left in the snow outside their bungalow. These footprints were shown in a photo next to a ruler and they measured six inches in length and easily the same in width. Later that year, the police were contacted on three separate occasions with reported sightings of a large wildcat in the same area. These sightings have continued, and the most recent was in 2019. But whether the fen tiger really exists still remains a mystery. So it would seem that old Shook has a rival, but from urban legends to malevolent folkloric beings, the creatures of the marsh don't confine themselves to large cats and dogs. Oh no. Another wild animal of the fen is the Lincolnshire shagfole, which has glowing eyes and seeks to lead you from the path into treacherous boggy ground. It takes the appearance of a foal or donkey, and the shag refers to the rough coat. Sometimes this is seen as a calf, also known as the lackey-causey calf, or in Scunthorpe, the tatterfole. 
because, well, it's a tatty-looking beast. And this too seeks to lead women and children from the safety of the path. It's interesting, though, that it specifically refers to women and children as opposed to just everybody. In some legends, it is told that this creature is an amalgamation of the souls of murder victims who have died in the marsh. A terrifying thought. But if you're wandering the marshes, I'm not sure it's the wild creatures that you should be worried about. In fact, folklore tells us it's the boggarts, boggles and will-o'-the-wisps that are far more prevalent and dangerous. A boggart is very often used to refer to a troublesome household spirit, also known as hobs. But in East Anglia, more often than not, a boggart is found in the marshes, the swamps or the fens. These creatures are also referred to as boggles or bogeymen, if you like. They're all equally malevolent, far more malevolent than your average household hob. These little sprites are often listening to your conversations as the girl in the story The Green Mist discovers. And so you will do well to be careful what you wish for when wandering their territory. Incidentally, you can listen to that story as my illuminated tale this month on the Patreon. Whilst the Boggart's household cousins are often to blame for souring milk and upsetting freshly baked bread, the Boggart of the Marsh is held accountable for far more heinous crimes. For example, the disappearance of children. They will frighten horses and harass weary travellers by letting out shrill screams, howling and other unholy noises. Their appearance is in the main human-like, but they will often be covered in hair or with disproportionately long arms. Some have chains that trail behind them and even when dead, a boggart can still cause mischief. Boggles are another form of boggart, although they are considered to be particularly evil, and in Lincolnshire they are believed to be a form of undead that haunts the marshes until their decaying corpses finally disintegrate and then they will be forced to return to the earth. Some boggles appear as a light, a little bit like the -the will-o'-the-wisps, which I'll talk about in a moment, but interestingly these spirits often guard treasure. I'm not sure who dare try to retrieve that treasure, though, or anyone that's lived to tell the tale. There are, of course, ways of defending yourself from a boggle or a boggart. Chance and smearing blood on your doorframe seems quite extreme, but it is one way. Perhaps easier is the use of bread and salt as offerings to appease the spirits of the marsh and, in fact, increase the yield in the crops that year. When the winter comes, though, That's the worst time to be caught in the marshes, for obvious reasons, but apparently the boggarts are idle, and their idle hands fall to mischief. The residents around the marshes will wait with anticipation for the green mist to come rolling across the land, signalling the spring. And this gave rise to that story I mentioned earlier, the green mist. Also found in the marshes are will-o'-the-wisps, Ethereal lights that float above the ground. No, not the 1980s television show. Their Latin name is Ignis Fatus, which means giddy flame. It's a very apt description. These lights are said to lead travellers astray and strand them in the bog. Their purpose is unclear, other than to, yes, confuse innocent visitors on the marsh. Are you noticing a theme here with these marsh spirits? I think the strong message throughout this episode has to be that when walking in marshland, stick to the path. The lights themselves are said to be held by a ghost, tragically, usually that of an unbaptised child. Alternatively, they are fairies or pixies known for their trickery, the brand of which is particular to them. Science seeks to explain these lights as the burning of gases which has escaped from the peat and organic matter as it decays on the marsh. I'll leave it up to you whether that's what it is or not. The name comes from the name for the bundle of sticks, sometimes lit and used as a torch, a wisp. The will in the name perhaps refers to the folkloric ghostly figure that is thought to be carrying these torches across the marshes. A soul trapped in purgatory and long lost in the dark of the marsh. The story of Will is very much the same as that of Stingy Jack, an old Irish folk tale. Whether it's dancing lights or dancing boggarts, when you go into the marshes, you best be prepared for anything. 
As previously mentioned, we have long since sought to tame the fens and make use of the land for agriculture by draining them dry. But it wasn't always that way. And a fine example of how some have used them to their advantage is the legend of a man called Hereward and his defeat of William the Conqueror. In the 11th century, Eli in Cambridgeshire was effectively an island in the Fens, and it is here that we find Hereward. He's an outlaw, and he was made so in the time of Edward the Confessor. He's holed up with his supporters. William the Conqueror sought to, well, conquer the Isle of Eli, and was three times thwarted by Hereward in his attempts to build a causeway across the Fens. On the third attempt, it is said that Hereward, disguised as a potter, snuck into William the Conqueror's camp and overheard their plans. At an advantage, Hereward and his men now hid in the rushes, as William the Conqueror's men built a third causeway and began to march along it. Hereward set fire to the rushes around them and engulfed the Normans, who, when trying to escape, were either killed by Hereward's archers or drowned in the marsh. So that's an example of somebody using the Fenland and the marshland to their advantage. But when the fens were eventually drained, it was no human that stood against them. It was the Tiddymen. Tiddymen are usually associated with Lincolnshire, and according to the folklore map of Britain, which I have referenced in the show notes, they are particular to Anchecombe Valley. The Tiddymen's voice is said to sound a little like a lapwing's call, or peewit as the lapwing is called and he controls the rise and the fall of the waters of the fen. He's a marsh spirit, a protector of the fens and the cars. He's around two foot tall, with white hair and a white beard. He's not as troublesome as a boggart. In fact, he's likely to help keep the waters of the marsh from flooding your house, just as long as you respect the land. The Tiddyman will also gladly accept offerings, and in exchange he will not only prevent the waters flooding your property, but he will also ensure that there is not a drought. If you don't pay your respects to the Tiddyman, though, he's likely to keep you up all night with his peewit shrieking. It's also said that he will bring death and disease to the villagers and their cattle that live beside the marshes. As a consequence, a little song is sung to the Tiddyman to ensure he does not turn feral, and the chorus is Tiddyman, Tiddyman, without a name, white heed, walking lame, while the water teems the fen, Tiddyman'll harm none. So what happened when they decided to drain the fens? In the 17th century, a group of Dutchmen, led by Cornelius Vermeiden, attempted to drain the fen. This led not only to unrest from the local cars people, who relied on the land for fishing and fowling, but it also brought the wrath of the Tiddyman down upon the community and the men trying to drain the fen. The murders that occurred during this time were blamed on the Tiddyman, and the story I'm about to tell you originates from this time. It is a dire warning to anyone who seeks to take control of the waters of the fen. There are all manner of beasts in the fens, they say. Boggarts, boggles, will-o'-the-wisps, disembodied hands, lost souls, ghouls, witches. In the darkness, there are many things that wish to see you harmed. They moan and wail at the moon all night long, and it's only the bravest of the folk who seek to walk the marsh at night. But there is one creature who may help keep the marsh from your door. And he is the Tiddyman. Tiddyman, Tiddyman, without a name, white he walking lame, while the water teems the fen Tiddyman'll harm none. No, the Tiddyman will harm none. With his hobbly walk he roams the marsh, his home is a dank green hole in the ground beneath the reeds and rushes, and he measures the water with care and attention. If it's dry, he'll call the rain, and as the waters rise, he listens. He listens to the call of the villagers whose thresholds are threatened, and he'd hear them cry. 
Tiddyman, Tiddyman, without a name, white heed and walking lame, while the water teams the fen, Tiddyman will harm then. And with a pee-wit, he would leap across the peat and see to it that the water did not breach their homes. And when the villagers heard that sound, they knew that Tiddyman was abroad and helping them. But not everyone understood the delicate balance of that marsh. Not everyone understood the importance of the Tiddyman. They didn't understand how much he could give and how much he could take. So when out-of-town folk arrived, Dutchmen from far away, wanting to tame that land and make use of it for their own ends, they did not bank on the sprite of the marsh. The Tiddyman, Tiddyman without a name, white heed and walking lame, while the water teams the fen, Tiddyman or harm then. The people who lived by the marsh knew this, though. They knew it, and so they wouldn't help the Dutchman. The Dutchman told them that their illnesses, their aches and their pains and their fevers and their shaking, they would all be gone with the marsh water. It was the damp conditions that caused it. But no, the people knew. They knew even when they were told that there would be lush fields in their place and no more pesky boggarts and wailing souls, the marsh would be reclaimed, tamed, brought to heal. But the people knew. Better what you know than what you don't, and there are far worse afflictions than marsh fever. The Dutchman had come a long way, though, and with the promise of land, and they were not turning back. They dug and drained and dried the bog until it was tame and ready for the fields that would soon spring up from it, and the villagers waited, whispering under their breaths. Tiddyman, Tiddyman without a name, white heed walking lame, while the water teams the fen, Tiddyman will harm then. It wasn't long after the work started that the Dutchmen started to disappear one by one. Others would search the dried marshland for them, but none were found. It was as if the land had just opened its peaty moor and swallowed them whole. But the folk of the marsh knew. They knew. Tiddyman, Tiddyman without a name, white heed walking lame, while the water teams the fen, Tiddyman will harm then. Well, the waters aren't teeming the fen anymore, are they? And the work continues. More men were brought in to continue the drainage and more men disappeared. When enough Dutchmen had disappeared, well, the ills started to come to the folk of the marsh. Livestock got sick, calves and lambs died, horses went lame, milk curdled, and the marsh folk children started to sicken with a new illness, limp and white in their mother's arms. Even their houses felt the effects of this sickness, Thatches collapsed and walls cracked. The marsh folk couldn't understand what was happening. It wasn't their choice to drain the fens. Why was the Tiddyman cross with them? They went to the wise woman and asked her. She needed no screeing bowl to tell them. You didn't stop them, she said. Tiddyman, Tiddyman without a name. White heed walking lame. While the water teams the fen, Tiddyman will harm men. But you stood by. You expected the Tiddyman to curse them. Now he's cursing you. So the marsh folk knew not what to do. They could not stand against the Dutchman. And there's no way they could stand against the Tiddyman. They watched as the Tiddyman's anger took cattle and children and more and more each day. It drained hope from their souls in exchange for the water of the fen. Wee Sally sat on her mother's lap, wheezing and coughing. Let's sing to him again, said Sally. Sing to the Tiddyman as we used to. We've got to try something. And so finally they sang. Tiddyman, Tiddyman without a name, white heed and walk in lame, while the water teams the fen, Tiddyman will harm none. 
The next house heard Sally and her mother sing and they sang too. Tiddyman, Tiddyman without a name, white heed and walk in lame, while the water teams the fen, Tiddyman will harm none. And then the next house, Tiddyman, Tiddyman without a name, and the next, white heed walk in lame, and the next, while the water teams the fen, and the next, Tiddyman will harm then until the whole village was ringing with the sound of the Tiddyman's song. Louder and louder they sang, crescendoing in the moonlight, their voices reaching far across the dried marsh. All the folk heard it. Even the Dutchman draining the fen could not deny it. They heard the sorrowful sound high above the marshes. It was the Tiddyman's reply. The marsh folk knew they had been heard and knew what they had to do next. And on the next new moon, they took buckets of water out and poured them onto the dry fenland and shouted, Tiddyman without a name, here's water for thee, take thy spell undone. There was silence like no other that filled that marsh, no peewit to be heard, until a low murmuring, a rumbling, a wailing, a hissing as the sky brought forth such rains that the water seemed to rise before their very eyes. Around them the swirling mists of spirits reaching out to touch them, their clammy cold hands pressed against their cheeks, relatives passed on, long gone. The water pushed at their feet and the cold hands of brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles pulled at their faces. And then it was silent. No rain, no wind, just... For many years on, the marsh folk, on every new moon, would take buckets of water out to the land and pour it onto the marsh as an offering to the guardian of that place. The tiddyman would hear their song and he would know if anyone was missing, and unless they were ill in their bed, he would bring down a curse upon them and their kin, far worse than anything that had come before. And then one day, not that long ago, the tiddyman just stopped coming. No one really knows why. Perhaps he despaired of the destruction he saw the humans persisting in. Whatever it was, he just stopped. But if you happen to be on the marshes one day, I strongly recommend singing to the Tiddyman. For he may be listening, and you don't want to find out what happens if you don't sing. <coughs> I hope you enjoyed that story of the Tiddyman. I think it's a really interesting one because it's kind of a, an urban legend, myth and folklore all combined in one. And it has a very, very clear message about what happens if you don't respect the land. And those are my favourite stories to tell. So the Tiddyman will definitely be one that I tell again. Thank you to patrons for their continued support of my storytelling and the podcast. In the extended version of this episode, available on my Patreon, I will continue to look at the folklore of the fens with lanternmen, toadmen and some of the plant lore that is abundant on the marshes. The second story I'm telling for patrons for this episode is Long Tom and the Dead Hand. My patron is called Rewild Yourself Through Story and is focused on using story to reconnect with the land we live on and the nature within it. You can become a patron to benefit from a range of rewards, digital zines, ways to connect with nature through story, audio stories, extended versions of this podcast and even online workshops, and they are all available as rewards. There are, of course, other ways that you can support the podcast, and you can do this by sharing the podcast with your friends, leaving me a review, and all these things help these stories to travel to new audiences and find new souls to warm. If you wish to hear more stories woven with folklore and the old ways, you can find me on Instagram as dd underscore storyteller, on Facebook as dd storyteller, and via my Facebook group, Stories from Law. I hope to see you there, as I'd love to tell you another story. Until then, toodle pip. <laughs> <laughs>